Hello everyone, this is Rohan Shah with BestEconTutor.com and in this video we'll be talking about price ceilings, price floors, and quotas. So let's first talk about price ceilings. Now what a price ceiling means is that's when the government says this is the maximum price you're allowed to set. So you can't set any price above that. You can go below that if you want though. So let's take a look at the market for socks where the current equilibrium price is $5. Now before we get into this, let's think about what this really means. This means that every single sock ever is sold for $5. That's different from our real world where different socks are different prices, but keep in mind that in this theoretical fictional world of econ, uh, what we have is that every single sock ever is sold for that same price. So now, what if the government says that the price ceiling is, say, $6? What that means then is that $6 is the maximum price you can set, and so you can't go above that at all. Well, here's the thing, though. If our price is currently at five, if every sock in the world sold for five dollars and the government says, hey, you can't set it any higher than six, well, five isn't higher than six. So really, this is what would be considered a non-binding price ceiling because it has no effect on the equilibrium at all. So if the question is what happens uh, in this market to the equilibrium once a price ceiling of six dollars is imposed, the answer would be that it goes from 100 comma five to 100 comma 5. So that's non-binding. But what if on the other hand the question said that the ceiling was $4? Meaning the government said that $4 is the highest price you're allowed to charge. You can't go even a penny higher than $4. Well our current price is 5 so that's illegal now. So we'd actually have to lower it just to be able to be at most 4. The price needs to go down to 4. Right? Legally, it can go below four, but I mean, hey, if the market wanted to set a price as close to five as legally possible, the price is going to be set at four. The question then is, what's the new quantity? Well, the two sort of candidates seem to be 80 or 110. Well, let's think about what these points mean to figure out what the new equilibrium quantity will be. Well, this point means that the demand is 110 at the price of four. So... If the new price is $4, people, customers, that is, demand 110 socks. But businesses, this point, the supply is only 80. Businesses only want to supply 80 socks. So notice, these two aren't the same number as each other, which means people demand more socks than are supplied, and so that's why that gap over there is what's called a shortage. There's a shortage of socks because more socks are demanded than are supplied. So here's the thing though, in a free market you can't really force anyone to buy or sell something that they don't want to. So even though 110 socks are demanded, we can't really force anyone to sell more than the 80 that they want to sell. So the new equilibrium quantity transacted is going to be this over here, 80. So now the question is, what happens to the new consumer and producer surplus now that we know that the equilibrium is now over here at a price of 4 and a quantity of 80? Well. Let's first think about the producer surplus. Producer surplus, again, is the area underneath the price and above the supply curve. So it used to be this triangle over here underneath that price of five and above that supply curve, but now the price is only four, so the area is now only this much. This is the new producer surplus. So it went down by that trapezoid over there is what it went down by. Because it used to be all that, now it's only this much. So that's the new producer surplus. Now as far as the consumer surplus goes, here's where it might get a little weird, but what consumer surplus really is, is that it's the area underneath the demand and above the price. So, you know, it used to be this much, right? But now customers are paying less. They're kind of better off, right? They only have to pay $4. So it's now gonna include this, but here's the thing. It gets cut off at 80 because only 80 socks are sold now. Notice it used to also include this triangle over here because it used to be this much. Uh, but now they're not buying 
as many socks as they used to. They're only buying 80 instead of 100. So the consumer, the producer surplus clearly went down. The area in red over here clearly went down. But the blue area, the consumer surplus, is kind of ambiguous. Part of it's definitely going up because, you know, they have this rectangle that they used to not, but they're also losing a little bit. So the CS overall could go up or down, but the producers are definitely worse off. But one thing that is also clear is that the total of consumer and producer surplus is now only this much. It's less than what it used to be without the price ceiling. It's less specifically by this triangle, and that's why this triangle is the deadweight loss, because that's how much less total surplus there is for society to go around. Now let's talk about price floors. Let's say in some market, the equilibrium price is $8 and the quantity is 500. And if we have a price floor, now that's uh, a bare minimum price that you need to set. So you can't go any below that price. So here, what if the government set a bare minimum price of $10? Notice that this is a binding price floor because it's above our current equilibrium. So if we have to set a price of at least $10, we're gonna to have to raise our price from eight up to 10. And when we do that, now the demand is gonna be only 400, and the supply though is gonna be 600. Because at that higher price, if you look at that point at a price of 10, people wanna supply 600, but people only demand 400. So now here you have what's called a surplus of goods, meaning extra leftover goods. No relation, by the way, to the word consumer and producer surplus. Those are areas measured in dollars. This, is, this surplus is extra leftover unsold items because of a price floor. So no relation there, but in ceilings, as we saw earlier, just cause shortages, but floors, price floors, cause a surplus of goods. But either way, notice that the equilibrium quantity went down because here out of these two, again, you can't force anyone to buy or sell. So here, if only 400 items are demanded, only 400 will be transacted in the market. So the equilibrium quantity is only this much. And so here, what happens is the new consumer surplus is now instead of uh, this triangle, uh, it's only this much because now it's above 10 instead of above eight. But the producer surplus is this trapezoid now. So compared to what it would have been before, which is this much, Compared to that, without any floor, now that they're getting two more dollars, they kind of are this much happier. They have this much more surplus, but they did lose a little bit. So producer surplus could go up or down. I mean, ideally it goes up, right? That's the only reason a government would impose a price floor is to have somebody better off because again, the consumers are definitely worse off. There's a deadweight loss. So, you know, the ideal goal is to have the producer surplus go up, but it's theoretically possible uh, for it to go down if this area ends up being more than how much it goes up by. Now, one common example where they use price floors in the real world is actually a weird market called the labor market. The reason it's weird is because for the first time now, the demand, if this was, let's say this was the labor market. So if this is the labor market, that means it's the market for workers. So it's weird, but now for the first time, the businesses, instead of being the supply curve, are the demand curve. So the demand curve are the firms. Because the businesses are the ones, they're the customers, they're the ones paying for hours of work and the suppliers are the workers, right? An employee at Pizza Hut, for example, is a supplier in the market of labor. They're going, they're supplying the labor in Pizza Hut, they're the customer, they're the ones paying the worker, they're the customer. So let's say we have uh, you know, in the labor market, this equilibrium, the free market equilibrium is $8. The price of labor is eight. In the labor market, there's actually a specialized name for that equilibrium price, and that's called wage. Wage is the price of labor. And a price floor in that labor market, that price floor would be called minimum wage. So that's what minimum wage really is from an economics perspective. Minimum wage is a price floor on the labor market. And once you impose that price floor of, let's say, $10, what you're going to get then is that businesses demand if you were workers, right? If you owned a business and you used to pay $8 an hour to people and you hired 500 of them, well, now, if you have to pay $10 an hour, you're going to demand fewer workers. You're probably going to have less room in your budget. So you're going to demand fewer workers. But now, if you're an employee, 
and if you can now get eight dollars ten dollars an hour instead of eight more well you're gonna want to work more and so that's why the supply of labor actually goes up even though the demand goes down so you're gonna have then a surplus of workers workers who don't have uh, a job and that surplus has a specialized name in the labor market that is called unemployment so if you are talking about the labor market unemployment is the name for that surplus of workers now let's take a look at quotas a quota is a quantity control rather than a price control like ceilings and floor work so here if the government were to say for example that hey uh, in this market where 50 items are being sold you can't sell any more than 60 or something like that that would be a non-binding quota because again they're already selling less than 60 no big deal but what if they said that you can sell at most 40 what if the quota was at 40 well then it's technically illegal to sell 50 right because if you can only sell 40 so then the new quantity will have to go down from 50 down to 40 and the price if you look at the demand curve usually then what we what happens is the customers now because the good is scarcer only 40 are sold people are willing to pay more and so uh, the price would usually go up to 12 then for the customers and so the consumer surplus is now only going to be this much and for the producers well here's where uh, different instructors do it in different ways but uh, it sort of depends on which producers gets the right to get the rights to actually sell the item because again 50 producers want to sell it but if only 40 get to sell it kind of depends on who the quota holder is so uh, whoever the, if the quota holder is the one directly selling the good and they're getting to charge $12 to the customers well to some degree they're a little bit better off in that they can now charge 12 instead of 10 but they're also only selling 40 items instead of 50 so overall the producer surplus goes up a little bit it goes down a little bit so it's ambiguous but the consumers are definitely worse off and either way here you can see there's also a deadweight loss because the total CS and PS add up to less than what they used to add up when there was no government intervention so let's take a look at the big picture now we noticed that whenever there was a ceiling if it was a binding price ceiling it lowered the equilibrium price and it actually also lowered the equilibrium quantity transacted between consumers and producers and the consumer surplus was actually ambiguous right because some consumers the ones who actually got to pay the lower price they were better off but some consumers you know ones who didn't get to buy the product anymore they were worse off so it could go up or down but the producer surplus definitely went down because the producers not only did they get to have a lower price but they also had uh, sold a lower quantity and the data rate loss went up from zero to whatever that triangle would be in that case right so data rate losses went up a floor on the other hand if it was a binding floor it raised the price up to what the floor is but the equilibrium quantity actually went down so notice that a ceiling and a floor they might seem like opposites and they do have an opposite effect on the price but they both lower the quantity transacted the consumer surplus though in this case definitely went down and here the producer surplus was the ambiguous one and it's a question mark here but really the intention is for it to go up but just to be thorough it's possible for it to go down or stay the same so it's ambiguous and here it's also caused some dead weight loss and the quota as we saw that definitely lowered the quantity and it also raised the price up to what the consumers uh, would pay for it and the consumer surplus went down producer surplus depending on if you're the quota holder could go up or down uh, and this caused a dead weight loss so this then is the big picture for what happens when the government intervenes all right let's take a look at a question from a student do price floors and price ceilings have the exact opposite effect as each other well they do have the exact opposite effect on the price given that they're both binding of course but they actually both lower the equilibrium quantity transacted so there's that they also both create a deadweight loss so there's that so they both have a similar effect in that sense that they both lower the quantity create a deadweight loss but they do have an opposite effect on the price and they do both create uh, one creates a shortage the ceiling and one creates a surplus the floor now let's take a look at another question if they always cause a deadweight loss why bother having a ceiling or a floor great question because they necessarily will create a deadweight loss 
in most markets. So why then would we have something like that? Keep in mind that the deadweight loss is only one measure of efficiency. It's only measuring the total surplus, whether the total is going up or down. But as we saw, most likely if you were to have a ceiling, it lowers the price and some customers are better off. So yes, there's deadweight loss, but that deadweight loss doesn't mean every single person's worse off. In fact, some customers will be better off with the ceiling. So if you wanted to target a specific group and help them out, yeah, sure, it's going to cause more damage to other people. But if you wanted to do that, that's one reason you could implement a ceiling or a floor. Well, I hope you now understand economics better. And if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.